It's plastic, it's most likely beige, and it sounds like this. Chances are, if you grew up in the United States, you've played a recorder. It was a non-negotiable part of your elementary school education. And for that, you can thank this guy, Karl Orff, a passionate German composer. Originally, the recorder was handcrafted, wooden, and made for the highest of society. Even Vivaldi and Bach wrote pieces for the recorder. It doesn't rely on a reed or strings, just breath. It's in the flute family. In the 1960s, the recorder started being produced out of plastic, cheap plastic. So how did it become the clumsy, awkward sound we all used to play? That's where Orff comes in. He saw the recorder as an easy way to get kids to start playing music. The logic was simple. The recorder relies on rhythm rather than memorization. If you can sing, you most likely can play it. Orff had the best of intentions to inspire the next generation of musicians. And even though they can sometimes be annoying, our hats are off to you, sir, for changing the course of music education for generations to come. Love and rock and roll. It's the hippie creed, along with some flower power and some crunchy granola. And we call hippies crunchy granola because of, well, granola. The link between the people, the culture, and the granola, it started in 1969 at Woodstock. Organizers estimated that 200,000 fun-loving people would fill the small town of Bethlehem, New York for the three-day historic festival. But the number of attending doubled, and the next thing they knew, there were over 400,000 people camping out, which led to shortages, food shortages. And, well, that left the munchies craving free-loving hippies a little hangry. This is where the savior, Hugh Romney, came in. Hugh and his commune, Hog Farm, were hired to help organizers run the festival. Upon seeing the food shortage, they stepped in to help. They rounded up a group of volunteers, hit the streets, and came back with, you guessed it, granola! Members of Hog Farm filled tons of cups, and Hugh took the stage and announced there would be breakfast in bed for 400,000. The hippies ate it up, and for many, it was their first introduction to the crunchy stuff. And so there you have it. The original bond between crunchy granola and hippies was formed by granola at the one and only Woodstock Music Festival. Let's play a game. Think of a famous painting. Guess what? You just thought of me. Today, I'm the world's most renowned work of art, but it wasn't always this way. My story is full of surprises, and it all began in a studio in Florence. Well, here's the master himself, Leonardo da Vinci. He worked on me on and off for a few years towards the end of his career. You're a minor work, my dear. Some interesting shading, nothing more. We'll just see about that. Over the next 300 years, I hung quietly in French palaces and royal bathrooms. The things I've seen. Ah, oh, mon dieu! Until finally I was noticed by a man who had already made quite a name for himself. When Napoleon chose me to hang on his bedroom wall, people took notice. I look forward to sleeping with you, ma chérie. After he had his whole exile from France thing, they tossed me on a wall at the Louvre. But at this point, I was still just another Renaissance portrait until one night. Bella. I was stolen. It was pandemonium. Paris was in an uproar. The police hauled people in left and right. The hysteria hit a fever pitch when the police suspected and interrogated one of the most famous artists in the world, Pablo Picasso. J'accuse. But Picasso was innocent. The thief turned out to be an Italian carpenter. He was caught in Florence. Mamma mia! And I returned to the Louvre. From that day forward, I became the darling of the art world. Everyone wanted to see Napoleon's da Vinci painting Picasso was suspected of stealing. Soon, 
Tourists crowded in, and most people forgot why I was famous in the first place. That might raise some eyebrows, but not mine, since I don't have any. Oh, you didn't notice I don't have any eyebrows? I told you, I'm full of surprises. Country music and grabbing your partner for a dosy -si do? You probably have a fuzzy memory of trying to master these moves in middle school gym class, am I right? So why were we all forced to couple up and endure this embarrassment? Well, it's all thanks to Henry Ford. Now grab your partner and do -si do He was the father of the car and the assembly line. But here's a little known fact. Henry Ford loved to dance, especially with his wife Clara. Square dancing has deep roots in American culture dating back to colonial times. It remained popular until the waltz and polka went mainstream in the 19th century. So in the 1920s, Ford took it upon himself to revive the old tradition. Let's do it, y'all. He opened a ballroom in his hometown and encouraged his factory workers and their families to take part. He felt square dancing helped teach manners, exercise, values, and grace. Soon after, he worked to create a national square dancing program. Boards of education across the country started endorsing Ford's mission, and since then, students have been taught to square dance. Today, 24 states still list square dancing as their official state dance. So if you feel like reliving awkward gym class moments, I'm sure you can find square dancing lessons somewhere nearby. All jump up and never come down, swing your pretty girl round and round. Uh, Mother's Day, the one day a year where people all over the world pay tribute to mom, mama, mum, or ma. But how did it all begin? Enter Anna Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day who came to despise her own holiday. Anna Jarvis really, really loved her mother. Her mother dies in 1905, and in 1907, she really starts this campaign that we need to have a day in honor of what mothers do. That's Dr. Catherine Antolini. She's an historian and wrote a book about Anna. She always identified herself as Anna Jarvis, the founder of Mother's Day. And in 1914, after six years in state-by-state -state campaigning, Jarvis's dream came true. President Woodrow Wilson officially designated the second Sunday of May as Mother's Day. Hooray! Right? Jarvis felt Wilson was taking credit for her efforts, and he wasn't the only source of her ire. Anna had a really wonderful enemies list. She was mad at the candy industry, and she was mad at the floor industry, and she was mad at all these charities. She also turned on some of her early allies, including John Wanamaker, a business tycoon who saw a commercial opportunity in Mother's Day. He started putting the holiday on everything, even dishes at his restaurant. Jarvis did not approve. She ordered this Mother's Day salad, and once the salad arrived, Mrs. Jarvis just dumped it on the floor and walked out. That was not what the day was supposed to be. What exactly was the day supposed to be? So it really wasn't meant to be go out and rush out and buy all these flowers and greeting cards and candy and gifts. It was just go home and spend the day with your mother. That's all she wants. I wonder what Anna Jarvis would say about the way Mother's Day is celebrated today. She would still be defending it against commercialization. We celebrate this holiday in ways that she doesn't think we should. Hear that, people? Don't forget about Anna Jarvis, the mother of Mother's Day. And please, send your mom a card. For her, a greeting card would be insincere. It would be cheap, it would be lazy. If you can't go home, then you know, write a letter to her, not just send a card. Got it. Write your mom a handwritten letter. She deserves it, don't you think? If you know donuts, you know the pink donut box. Especially if you're familiar with Southern California, which has hundreds of donut shops, most with the pink boxes. But while you may recognize the box, you may not know it's central to a story about chasing the American dream. The pink box phenomenon all started with a man named Ted. Ted Noy came to California as a Cambodian refugee in the 1970s. He got into the donut business and became the owner of dozens of shops. Ted sponsored other refugees, taught them the business, and helped them open their own shops. Since Ted used the pink boxes, so did everybody else. Ted became known as the Donut King. My name is Mealy Chow, and I am the Donut Princess of LA. The Donut Princess's great uncle, the one and only Donut King, Ted Noy. He taught Maylie's parents the business in the 1980s and they started this shop. 
Maylee took it over a few years ago. And beyond Maylee, Ted's legacy lives on through, you guessed it, those pink boxes. When we came to LA, my parents owned a donut shop for 26 years. We used the pink donut boxes. In the Asian community, red is a lucky color, so therefore using the pink box, it's no coincidence about it. The pink box is overwhelmingly the favorite of the donut shop industry. That's Len Bell. He should know. His company manufactures about 12 to 15 million donut boxes every year. Cheers. While the pink boxes are still an iconic part of the donut landscape, owners are putting a new spin on things. Maylee makes some of the same donuts her parents used to make, but like everything, times are a-changin'. When I took the business over from my parents, they were using the generic pink boxes that you see everywhere. But our donuts were not generic, and I needed to reflect that upon our new upgraded boxes. And what does your mom think about that, Maylee? My mom does not really approve of the new boxes. They're a little bit more expensive, and it's not really what she's used to. But I think it's a sign of new donut times. Yum. Sounds delicious. 